Bible, and I hope you remember to bring your Bible today. We're going to go to Luke chapter 15. Today is our last Sunday that we're going to be looking at the parables. Uh, you're going to say, do we do them all? No. Do we do half? No. We did about a third of the parables. But we're going to go ahead and make our way towards Thanksgiving, and then we're going to make our way towards the announcement series. And so we'll talk about the fifth day. So if you have your Bible, uh, we're going to be talking about the parables. And as we make our transition from Luke 15 to the parables, we're also going to talk about lost and found. Now, how many of us know that this is the greatest chapter in the entire Bible for parables? We have the parable of washing. We have the parable of lost coin. We have the parable of the faithful father. And I'll explain that one a little bit more. Uh, but we want to talk about today that really in this chapter, Jesus is saying what was lost is now found. And the big emphasis is on seeing people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You see, as a church, uh, meaning not just this church, but the people who believe that Jesus died on the cross, rose out of the grave, is living again, vicariously paid the punishment of your sins and every sin that ever was. If we believe <laughs> that, the church is not coming together just to sing. The church needs to go out and to witness. What did Jesus say when he left his disciples for the last time? Did he say, y'all come together and sing? <coughs> Did he say, y'all come together and pray? Did he say, y'all come together and just read the Bible? He said, go into all the world. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't do those things, because as it says in Hebrews, we're not supposed to forsake those. But this is where we go to get pumped up. And then we go out into the world to share the world the good news that Jesus gives, that Jesus saves, that Jesus loves, and Jesus is coming again. And so we want to see lost people become found people so that the church will grow. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean this church. You know, uh, if, if all of a sudden we had 3,000 people coming, but we just had 3,000 people coming and no one's lives were being changed, we just had 3,000 people coming. You see, we want to expand heaven, not just expand the sanctuary. And so our goal as a church is to train people to love lost people and know what to say to lost people. So that when you go to work and you go to the ballpark and you go to school uh, and, and you're with your friends uh, and whatever it is and wherever it is you go, that the love of Jesus is so real that they don't just see you, they see him vicariously living through you. That's our goal. And so we want to see lost people get saved. Now, it starts off, what have we learned so far in Luke 15? That sinners were drawing near him. You see this in, in verses 1 and 2. And so sinners were drawing near him to listen. The word here for listen is akuate. It's where we get our word acoustics. But the difference is not just being able to hear, but hearing with the intention of doing something with what you just heard. So in other words, you know, like if I was going to train JJ on how to be a better, you know, mixed martial arts fighter, and he does need my help. <laughs> you do need my help, right? You do need my help. You know, I would want to tell people, how many of you know that I was special forces in the U.S. Army? So when I laugh about that, you laugh, but you, you possibly could use my help. You could probably still be yeah, but that's okay. <laughs> when I tell him to drop his guard, because you know you can't tell when a you know crazy. So you've got to encourage people, keep it up. But if all they have to do, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, and then didn't go out and do any of it, he had heard, but had he heard? One of the strangest phenomena is we have never had more good information than we have in the world today. And we have never been so out of touch with what to do with that information than we are in the world today. How many of us know that a good diet would work? How many of us eat a good diet? How many of us know that we shouldn't smoke? How many people you know that even after they have a tray learn how to smoke through the hole in the, the cancer in the throat? How many of us know what we should do but that doesn't mean that we are doing it. Let me just say this. Knowing and not doing is worse than not knowing. Wow. And so they were listening because why? They were the, the sinners. They knew they were the scribes. Uh, I knew they knew they were the tax collectors. They knew they were the prostitutes. They knew they were the people that really needed. And the Pharisees, instead of saying, we love lost people, the Pharisees were saying what? Those are the scum of the earth. We don't want anything to do with those. We don't want them to come to our church. We don't want them to come to our meals. We don't want to associate them. We just want it, we just want it to be us over here and you over there. And, and don't, don't come over here. We, we don't want you around. 
And what did they complain about Jesus? That he not only accepted them, but he ate with them. In other words, in their age, if you sat down and shared a meal, you considered yourself on mutual ground. That's why, what do we call that when we have that once a month, when we, when we take the cracker and we take, just what do we call that? What do we call that? Communion. Communion. Why? Because we are equally communing with Christ and each other. In other words, when Jesus ate with sinners, he was saying what? I don't approve of what you're doing, but I still love you. I still love you. And the, and the Pharisees were grumbling. Now, the sinners were listening. And the people who were in charge of teaching and reaching were grumbling. Now, again, do you know any grumblers? Do you know any grumblers? They may do what they're supposed to do, but the whole time they're doing, nah, 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 nah. and then you say, what? Nothing. <laughs> you know, all right, so you know what I'm talking about. And it says that they were grumbling. And they said, this man, take a look at verse 2, this man. Now, they won't even call him by his name. And that's going to come up later, because in the, in the parable of the two sons, the one son refuses to call the other son his brother. He says, that son of yours. Wow. This man loves sinners. That's exactly why Jesus said he came. He came because he loved us, and at one time, all of us were unredeemed. If you're here today, and you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, you are a saved sinner. And I'm going to say this again. If any of you are here today that has never sinned and never will sin, you really don't need to come. You don't. Because you don't need a Savior. But how many of us think anyone here today fits that first category? So in other words, you could look at everybody and everybody could look at you and say, you really need to be here today. <laughs> okay, so you got what I'm saying. These are the concepts of the first two parables. We have the story of the lost sheep. They have the story of the lost coin. What symbolic do they mean? Jesus is always taking the initiative. He is always out there looking. He is looking for that lost sheep. He is looking for that lost coin. He's looking for you. And, and he doesn't stop until he finds you. And if you're the lost sheep that is finally willing to say, rescue me, he picks you up, puts you on his shoulders, and carries you the rest of your life. Not just here on earth, but carries you the rest of your life. How long is that? Anybody can tell me what eternity looks like in numerology? Bigger than you can ever put into. Uh, anybody familiar with Google? And I'm not talking about the, the site. I'm talking about the number. It's a number one with a hundred zeros behind it. And guess what? Compared to God's love and eternity, it's that, it's that long a time. Wow. And so it's the lost coin. In other words, you have value. I don't know how many people just think that their life is a wreck. And, you know, it can be. But that mean, doesn't mean you're a lost cause. Your life may be a wreck, but you are still valuable to God. You know what God calls you? His special jewels and his special treasure chest. You know what that means? Even when you're away from him and, and disrespect him and disown him and don't even want to call him daddy and say, God, you're dead to me. Guess what? He still loves you. Wow. What a great concept. Now let's go ahead and take a look at this. The lost sheep in verses uh, 3 through 7. We have lost coins in verses 8 through 12. Today we're going to start seeing that there is joy over the lost when the lost becomes the bound. So let's take a look at what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the faithful father. There's going to be four different sections to the story. The first one, verses 11 through 16, we're going to talk about the confrontation. This is the younger son with his daddy. Then we're going to talk about the confession and compassion. Actually, how many of us know this prodigal son story? Anybody know the story? And so uh, uh, he's going to run away from home. He's going to squander. And, and we'll talk about all of that. But he has a, a confession, and then he experiences his father's compassion. And then we have the boy that didn't leave home and his problem with his daddy. And then at the end, we're all going to celebrate. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you have your Bible, let's be kidding. And it says there was a man who had two sons. Now, this is not just saying that God only has 50% of the people going to heaven and 50% of the people not going to go to heaven. It's a story about a father with two sons, okay? And there was a man who had two sons. And the youngest of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property that is coming to me. Now, according to the Bible, there's a thing called a birthright. 
In the birthright, however many sons that were in the family, the oldest son got a double portion of what all of the other sons got. So if you only had two sons, they would divide the property into thirds. The first one would get two-thirds, and the youngest one would get one-third. Naturally, if you had four, it would be two-fourths, one-fourth, one-fourth. If you had 12, then you see how the double portion works, and we find that in Deuteronomy chapter 21, not 32-4. And so uh, we find that in Deuteronomy 21, 17. Okay, and so we got that now. All right. and, and so we find that in there. But you didn't get your inheritance until the father died. And the oldest son got his inheritance first. So what was he saying? I want to bypass my brother. I want to bypass my father. And I want to act like I'm the only one that's important in this world. In fact, he was looking at his dad and he was saying, I wish you would just die. Now let's just be honest. How many of us as a teenager, or if you are a teenager, has ever thought in your mind, Oh, man, I wish my mom was quit bugging me. I wish my dad would quit bugging me. I wish they'd just leave me alone. In fact, I've known some who have said, I, w I wish they were dead. Now, what do they mean by that? Literally dead or just out from under your authority? And that's what he's saying. I don't want to be under your authority. So the younger son said, Dad, you're dead to me. So I want you to notice. So the father divided the property. How many of you would do that? How many of you, if your son walked up to you and said, George, uh, hey, Dad, you're dead to me, so give me my money, okay? And George would say, okay. Notice this father does it. This father does it. And because he loves his son, and sometimes you've got to let someone fail before they understand they have fallen. You see, so many of us rescue people. So many of us would sit them down and say, now think about it. Don't do this and don't do that. You, sometimes you just got to let them, but you've got to be close enough to them to catch them when they fall. You know what the church needs to be? I've heard a lot of people say that the church needs to be right on the edge of the cliff so that when the people get close to the edge of the cliff, we can take out a hook and say, whoa, come back here. But you know, there are some people that you rescue over and over again, and they never realize that they need to be rescued. And then every time you, they, you bring them back, they say, what's the matter with you? You don't have any fun. Because the only fun is jumping off the cliff, right? But how many of us know that we need to have the church right next to the edge of the cliff, but we need to have an ER at the bottom for all of those who do jump? And we're going to discover that God is on the top, God is on the bottom, and he expects us to fill the gap in the career. Wow, this is important stuff. And so the older son received this. Notice when the father divides it up, he doesn't just give it. He says, and the father divided the property, how does it say in verse number 12? Between them. He gave the older son the two-thirds. In other words, he cashed out. He was willing to cash out. Now, how many of you ever had money in your pocket that burned a hole in it? Or in your pocketbook? Anybody? Anybody? Come on, let's just be honest. I, I'm, I mean, uh, how many of us have ever said this? Well, I've got some extra money. I think I'm going to put some in the bank. I'm going to naturally tithe. When do we start teaching tithing? When you first give your children their allowances, right? Because how else then do they learn that their money is really God's money? And I know you guys, I think somebody told me this morning at the early service that the average allowance for a teenager this day is $50,000 a year. <laughs> That's what they said they wanted. Uh, uh, and so, uh, <laughs> but when do we start teaching that God's money is God's money? When all of a sudden they get a full-time job, or when they get there, we just start teaching it, right? And so how many of you, now let's just be honest, how many of you, when you get some money, and it doesn't have to be a large amount of money, to me, $10 is a lot of money. If somebody gives me $10, the first thing I'm doing is the math. Not because I'm a statistician, because I want to be honest and discipline myself that this actually all belongs to God. He's letting me keep 90%. So let's honor him first. And we give him the 10%. Now, this son didn't want to give anything back. Uh, he just said, this is mine, and it's burning a hole. Now, how many of you know this verse, 1 Timothy 6.10? If you don't know it, write it down somewhere in your Bible. It says this, do you not know that the love of money is the beginning of all evil? Now, it does not say money, but the love of money. Now, what's the difference? You know what the love of money is? When was the last time you took a dollar bill? Or maybe for you it's a $50 bill. Or maybe for you it's a $100 bill. And you held it in your hand and you went, I wish 
<laughs> and then all your hair falls out and you look like an ugly person in the mirror. Okay. When was the last time the, the, the money itself is what? It is a means to an end for who? Me. So when you look at that money and you go, my precious, you know who your precious is? You. Because it's the love of what the money can do for me that's the beginning of all. In other words, I will do whatever it takes to you. It gets me money. Wow. The love of money. Now the word in there in the Greek is man. And it literally doesn't mean just money. It means anywhere that you can take an advantage. So uh, it could be an advantage in a business proposition. It could be an advantage. So in other words, everything and everyone becomes an obstacle for me to step on so that I can elevate myself. That's the love of money and the power and prestige that comes with it. And so this youngest son says, I just, I just want the best for me. And I don't care what it does to my dad. I don't care what it does to my brother. I don't care what it does to... I just want me. And the next thing you do is you have some money, road trip. Anybody ever been on a road trip? That maybe didn't start off as a road trip, but somewhere along the way became a road trip? He says, and then he went on a journey and, and went to a far country. Now, uh, the word there says that he squandered. Anybody have squandered or wasted his money there in verse number 13? And he went on a, on a road trip, and while he was away, he squandered or wasted his money. Uh, this is the Greek word for that. Dio scorpizo uh, literally means to squander waste by scattering it. That means he didn't just go buy a new guitar or buy a new car. He dropped a, a couple of shekels here and a couple of shekels there and a couple of shekels here and, and, and a couple of shekels there. Oh, that looks good. Oh, it's sort of like walking through the mall. Anybody ever walk through the mall with some shekels in your pocket? <laughs> and you know you've got enough shekels to, yeah, well, yeah. And, you know, Window shopping is only fun when you don't have any money. Window shopping becomes shopping when you do. Because, what? Well, I can buy it. I can buy it. I can, and then I deserve that. I, I, you know, I look good. I <laughs> and what is the purpose of all that buying? To make me feel better about me. And so he squandered. He wasted it. Notice it says on reckless living. He said he squandered his money on reckless living. Now let me tell you, reckless living does not necessarily mean sinful. You see, it doesn't mean that he had to be buying drugs. It doesn't mean that he had to be buying women. It just means that he was not honoring God. Did you know that you can live recklessly by living semi-holy? How much, how much sin do we have to have in our life before we are no longer righteous? How many sinful purchases? It could be bringing home an R-rated movie and showing it to your kids. Think about that for a second. And then say, why do they use that language? Well, maybe they learned it from the movie you buy home. Why are they having those kinds of dreams? Why are they getting involved in those kinds of activities? Maybe your finances is bankrolling their lifestyle. You see, that's reckless. And it may not have been, you know, a sinful activity, but it accumulates to sin in the life of the other person. That's reckless and it's sinful. I want you to remember, this is a parable. And Jesus does not say how he squandered his money, but he does say that he did. Now, the older brother is going to naturally say, well, he's putting on women, he's putting on booze. Because we think when somebody goes out and squanders, they do what? Spend it on women and spend it on booze. Too many times, that's exactly right. But how many times do we just assume the worst? But hear me, even when we assume the least, it's still right. And so he goes ahead and goes and spends everything. Now, how many of you have all of a sudden tried to account for every penny you spend on a weekly basis? Anybody ever do that? Yeah. I'm going to find out where my money is going. Uh, every time I spend the money, I'm going to write it right here in this little notebook. You run out of ink. <laughs> you know, how many of us go, well, I didn't spend that much. I don't even have to keep track of that. Anybody ever try to keep track of every piece of food you eat during the course of the week? Well, that was only, that was only 10 calories. I don't have to keep track of that. I already asked for God for a minute about that one. So that one's forgiven and forgotten because God takes it away from the east and the west, so it's like I didn't need it. <laughs> How many of us try to play that game with our finances? And all of a sudden we go, oh, where did all my money go? Now 
let's just be honest. When was the last time you opened up your wallet, and at one time it actually had some money in it, and there's no money in it, and the first thing you say is, where'd that money go? Ever happened? Where'd that money go? And the first thing I say is, Margaret, why are you taking money out of my wallet? I'm so glad Bill's not here because I know I can count on you guys not to run out there and tell. <laughs> I will tell you this. One time I lost my, uh, my, my credit card that had her name on it. And the credit card company called me and they said, uh, we have found your wife's credit card. God was using it. I said, well, give it back to him. He's charging a lot less than she did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> That's not at all true, but I like that story. Okay. And so, he spends everything, and then all of a sudden, what happens? A severe famine. Now, this word here, persevere, means that the rich <coughs> had something, and everybody else had something. Now, how many of you know how it's like right now in the economy that we're in to have less money than you had a year ago? How many of us know what it's like right now to have less opportunities than we had a year ago? How many of us know right now that our houses might be worth uh, uh, you know, a tenth of what the value was five years ago? How many of us know that we are living in some severe times? But they're saying it was so severe that they didn't even know if they'd eat today. Or this week. Or if. It was so severe that he got a job because he was in severe need. Now let me ask you something. How many of you have ever had a job offered you that you would never do until times got rough? And then all of a sudden you'd say, I'll never do that. Uh, tell me about that job. And the times got so bad that he took a job feeding pigs. Now, what do we know about the Israeli people and pigs? We know that in the Old Testament, they're considered unclean. Unclean. And so were they, were they even supposed to be uh, making barley? Predominantly, you do barley uh, crackers and break up barley bits to feed the pigs. Interesting side note. You know when Jesus fed the 5,000, does anybody remember they fed them with what? A couple of little what? And a couple of little what? What were the two elements that he fed? How many of us know that they were barley loaves? Interesting. And so he took the food that nobody else would have until there was food. And then, well, all right, it's barley loaf. I guess I'll eat it. Okay. And so he was feeding the pigs. And all of a sudden he says to himself, this is uncool. And this is not only uncool, this is uncool. And then he began to, uh, after he spent everything and he found himself in a foreign country, he started to feed the pigs and he was longing, take a look at verse 16, and he was longing to be fed with the pods. In other words, they were taking pea pods and, and other kind of pods and mixing it in with the barley pods and, and he said, I am so hungry, I'd even be willing to eat broccoli. That's pretty hungry. And so he said, I'd even eat this. You know, the word here for, and he was uh, longing to eat, uh, can be a positive or it can be a negative. I'm going to give you a word, and you tell me if it's a positive word or a negative uh, phrase. Here's the first one, root canal. <laughs> Anybody ever have a toothache? What's better, root canal or toothache? It just depends on what you're putting it next to. How about this? No pain or root canal. You see the progress? We've gone from eh to eh to eh. In other words, uh, uh, the word itself is just a word. It's the emotional that we tag to it. And this word here for longing can literally mean longing after God, where it can be longing after sin. It just queries your heart talk about this word desire. And so let's continue. And he came to his senses. Now, teachers love this phrase when I say they had an aha moment. But when he came to himself in verse number 17, now what does that mean? Well, whoa, I could have had a V8. <laughs> All of a sudden he came to himself. How, how long does it take for us to wake up to know that we got to do something? Uh, when you're in a bad situation, have you ever been in a bad situation and said, i got to do something, but it's only been a couple of years. I had a person tell me that one time. They said, you know, my life has really been a wreck, but it's only been a couple of years. What? I want you to think about Jonah. Well, oh, my life's really a wreck. I've only been in the belly of this whale for three days. What? The Bible says that after three days, he prayed. Now, let's just be honest. When you are being swallowed,
swallowed by a great sea monster. How many of you think, think I'll wait three days to test this out? <laughs> Let's just give it a chance. I might like it. Let's see who else he swallows. Maybe it's a good looking girl and we can just make a house right here in the belly of the great sea monster. Have a little hunter rays living all over the fish. Okay. And so how many of us have just learned how to get along in the mess we're in? And he comes to his senses. Now, you know what brings us to our senses when we discover we can't fix it? When we discover we just can't fix it, when it's beyond my ability. How many of us will manipulate and manipulate and manipulate until we can't fix it? Go back to that story of Jonah again. When all of a sudden Jonah told all the other sailors that it was his fault that the sea was churned up, he said, throw me into the, into the ocean and everything will be okay. Do you remember what those seasoned people did? They rode harder. In other words, they thought, if I just work harder, God will work it out. Let me tell you, the only way for God to work it out is to give it over to him. If, if we are faithful, we will confess to him. He will be faithful. He will forgive us and calm out the seas. But how many of us just stay in the mess we're in for days and weeks and months and years? We'll stay in it so long that we'll, somebody will say, well, how long has it been? Oh, I forgot. I just got so used to it that I didn't know I wasn't used to it anymore. Here's a truism. What bothers me is when what used to bother me doesn't bother me. And then he decided to fix it. Now notice, when all else fails, we will go back to daddy. Now what's the Hebrew word for daddy? Abba. What does Abba mean? God. Daddy. Father. When all else fails, people will try coming back to God. Now what would happen if they're a Judas? Now Judas all of a sudden had remorse. Uh, he, what I did was wrong. I sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And he, he wants to get some sort of guilt off his chest. And so he runs to the church. Isn't that where you go to find guilt relief? No. You run to God. You go to church to worship. You may sometimes go to church to ask for help. But he should have ran to the disciples. He should have ran to Jesus. Jesus is still alive at this time. This is the night before he is crucified. He could have ran to Caiaphas' house and cried out from the corner, Jesus, forgive me. But he goes to the church, and what does he hear from the church? Be gone with that money. That's blood money. So here he is trying to say, help. And what did they say? Get away. Here are these sinners uh, called tax collectors and, and women of the night in John or Luke chapter 15. And what did the Pharisees call them? Not good enough. You'll never do anything to the lost people. But you know what God would say? If you come running to me, you've never done anything bad enough that I can't forgive you. What a difference. And when all else fails, we go to his fathers. He says, my father's hired hands have it even better than I do. Now, this, this concept for my father's hired hands in verse number 17, we might think it might be that Greek word doulos for servant, but it's not. It's this word, mystos. It literally means I work for you because you're such a good boss, I don't want to go anywhere else. In other words, when we come to Jesus, we stay with Jesus because he's so good, it's better than anything and everywhere else. In John chapter 6, Jesus had been feeding the multitudes. And all the multitudes wanted was more food and more food and more wine and more food. And Jesus said, unless you drink my blood and eat my body, you have no part with me. He said, I'm not making any more special meals. No more happy sauce. And the crowd left. And he looked at his disciples and he said, are you going to leave too? Does anybody remember what Peter said? Where are we going to go? You are the only one that has the words of life and holiness. And where are we going to go? In other words, I'm not following you because you're giving me free handouts. I'm following you because I, I love the way you love me. I'm not forced. I'm not a slave. I'm a hired hand. I've bought into your program. He, he never called his father's people the doulos. This word mystos is only found in these two verses. No place else in the entire Bible. So he comes to his senses and he says, I will arise. Now I want you to notice, it is one thing to have an aha moment. It is another thing to have, aha, let's go. How many of you ever said, yep, that's a good idea, and still never did it? 
He comes to his senses and he leaves to go back to his father. And as he's going back to his father, it says that this word for arise means to come back to life. Literally, he is resurrected. In a resurrection of thinking, the Bible calls it this in Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, brothers and sisters, that you renew your mind. In other words, you need to have an aha moment and say, I will rise. Now, we don't rise, but we rise up in the of life. Just like we talked about when we were baptized. He says, I will rise, I will go back to my father. I will say to my father, I have sinned. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just treat me like one of the hires. Because even the hired hand is better than the hand that can plan. He comes to a sense. He says, I will rise. And he goes. After he goes, I want you to read with me Psalms 103, verse number 13. Read this with me out loud. As a father, as a father shows compassion on his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. You see, so many people are afraid to come back to God because they're afraid that God's going to say, you are no good. You didn't do it right. Oh, man, you are. You can't keep your hands up. Anybody can beat you up. I mean, we're afraid that he's going to do nothing but tear us down and criticize him. The loving father is going to say, come home. I missed you. Pray for you. Cry for you. I love you. You see, how many of us just write people off? Here's the truth. A loving father never stops loving. That doesn't mean that we approve of what people do. But a loving father, no matter what they have done or are doing, never stops loving. Now, how do we know that? Because that's the way God loves us. And what does he want us to do? Love others as he has loved us. The lost shepherd was looking. The lost lady with her coins was looking. The lost son, the father was looking. Now, I want you to notice the compassion of the father. When the father saw him coming from a distance, he runs to him. But that does not negate the fact that the son still needed to confess. You see, how many times have we done something, and we know that they kind of know, and now that we kind of know that they know, we think that they know that they know that we know that they know, so let's just leave it alone. There was a lady that got so upset with her son because she watched all these children coming out of a birthday party, and the mother was saying, here's your goodie bag, and the little child, but thank you, thank you. Thank you. But she couldn't hear everything that was going on. And so finally her son gets his bag. He's saying nothing. Just nothing. He just took it. Comes running out to the car. Said, how come? You didn't say thank you. And he says, well, all the other kids said thank you. And the lady said, don't mention it. So I didn't. <laughs> you see, we're so thinking that God's got to forgive us. We don't mention it. And hear me. If we confess, we get forgiven. If we don't mention it, we're still in the dead side. He comes running home to his father. But notice, before he even has a chance, God is looking for lost people to come home. He's longing for lost people to come home. And, and when they take one step, and hear me, you could have already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, but you are living outside the ring. <coughs> And when you take one move to get back into the ring, God snatches you and pulls you back in. He's right there ready to hug you and love you. Literally, it says that he embraces him, he kisses him, he restores him, he puts a ring on him, he puts a cloak on him, and he kills the fatty cat and tells party. That's how God feels when we come, either the first time or any time after we he doesn't say, oh, I can remember one time I had been inviting a person to church, inviting a person to church, inviting a person to church, and they finally came to church, and one of the people at the church said, look out, lightning's going to strike. And they never came back. We need to be bringing and loving and longing and crying and celebrating, and when they finally come, you embrace them. I used to be a mailman. And I would invite people on my mail route to, to church. And this one lady comes to church and she walks in. And I said, I'm so glad to see you. I'm so happy. And she looked at me and she goes, oh, I didn't recognize you with your clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> she was so used to seeing me in my mailman costume. And she says right out loud, I didn't recognize you with your clothes on. <laughs> 
It happens. We should celebrate because what? What they were not used to, they experienced. And hear me. It is so good to experience what we're not used to with God's love. We would love that the story ends here, but in verse number 25, it says the oldest son hears the party. Now, I want you to remember, the oldest son's already received two-thirds. Dad's already given up. And it's hinted at this phase that they, he's moved out of the house but still lives on the property. He's now the owner of the property, and Dad now lives in the back, and son has taken over the property. But he doesn't live with his father anymore. And he heard the music and dancing. Interesting words in the, in the Greek here. Take a look at them. Sufonio ke kero. Anybody see any words there? Symphony and chorus. He heard the symphony and the chorus. Literally, the chorus means the dancing, not just the refrain of the middle of the song. So he heard the music and the dancing, and he was far away, but he, he was close enough to hear, but not close enough to participate. Let me tell you. If you're a Christian who's walked away from God, the most dangerous place you can be is just close enough to hear what's going on in the heart of God, but not close enough to embrace and be embraced back. When Jesus was arrested, you know what the Bible says? That the disciples were watching the crucifixion from a distance. Because they thought that would be safe. Let me tell you, the only safe place to be is in the boat with Jesus. Okay. And so he didn't go in, and he wouldn't go in. And they said, your brother's come home. Now, I want you to know that he was mad at his daughter, father for receiving back a sinner. Wasn't that what the Pharisees said about Jesus in verse number 2? Why were they mad at Jesus? Because he was eating with a sinner. What is the whole purpose of this parable? To show that God wants to eat with sinners. And invite them in. Not to accept the bad behavior, but to accept the bad person. Who could be a beautiful change, a metamorphosis from a caterpillar to a butterfly. So it's not what we are doing, but what we could do once Jesus takes hold of our life. The Pharisees grumbled. The older son got angry. The word here for angry literally means this. It means to be provoked to the point where I'm inclined to be unimpassioned. And what does that mean? How many of us have ever seen something happen? Like somebody is walking, all of a sudden they fall down. The <laughs> Until we find out they're hurt, and then what do we do? But what is the first reaction too many times is we laugh at them. Now, this word for provoke means, and we laugh at them, and once we know they're hurt, we laugh more. That's what he, he is angry. And he is angry, angry. And he refuses to go in. Now, once he refuses to go in, I want you to remember that the shepherd was looking for the lost sheep, the woman was looking for the lost coin, the father was looking, and he is looking now not for the son who ran away, but for the son who stayed home. Because although he didn't separate himself by distance, he still was separated from his father's love. And the father came out to him. Now, the word here for comes out to him means he urged him, comforted him, pleaded with him, come on, come on. Come on, you know this is right. You know this is your brother. Come on, I want you to notice. He says, come in, come in. But what does the older brother say? He says, all my life, all my life, I have been one of your hired hands. Here's what it changes. He says, all my life I have served you. And the word that he uses is not mistos, it's your loss. So in other words, it was misery to be your son. How many people are just acquiescing to the Bible? They don't love God. And that's when all of a sudden we get these, these, these people that are, are, are nomanians. Now what does that mean? We're saved by doing the law. We don't love the Lord because he died for us. We just don't want to break the law. Isn't that what the Pharisees became? The Judaizers became? Isn't that what they told Job? Just confess anything. It doesn't matter what you confess. Lie to God if you have to. Just confess something so that he'll forgive anything. And everything will be okay again. In other words, we are crushed under the obedience of the law that the Bible says we could never fully obey. Aren't you glad that Jesus lifts up the law and says, I lived it, I obeyed it, I'll die for you, but I do want you to live for me. Not just obey the law, but love the Lord. You see, he thought his life was in slavery. He says, I have never sinned. I have never disobeyed you. Now remember, I said earlier, if you have never sinned, you don't have to come. And so this brother was saying what? I've never sinned. And he says, and you can do nothing. Now how many times has God really blessed you? But it's, it's been a while. 
And we forget his blessings. And we are we're way on that end, you God. And we might even say this, still you've never done anything really good for me anyway. I want you to notice that pattern. You've already gotten two-thirds of your father's inheritance. You've already lived on the land and kicked daddy out of the big house. Your, your brother has come home and it didn't cost you any of your sheep or, or your bull. The father take, took what little was left of his and gave it to him. It didn't cost you anything and you still won't go in. You see, he was provoked to be completely unpassionate. He not only says this, he says, your brother is here. He's not my brother, he's your son. Wow. And what were the scribes and Pharisees saying about the sinners? They're not our fellow Jews, they're what? They're tax collectors and sinners. It, it, it's the most severe form of racism. Because it's not one race versus another race, but elitism racism. I kicked you out of my race. He's not my brother. He's a son. Now, uh, he's saying, Dad, I have rejected him. And if you love me at all, you'll reject him too. But if you don't, I'm going to reject you. Wow. The Father says it's necessary. It's time to celebrate. It is necessary. The lost has come home. It is necessary for all of us, for the hired hands, for the wives, for all of us. We all need to celebrate. And, and it says, and it hints at the fact that when God celebrates, all of his sons and daughters should celebrate, unless we're not really one of his sons and daughters. You know, what really bothers me is when I hear somebody say, yeah, that church down on the street, it's really growing, in a negative way. Hey, listen, if the church down the street is reaching people for Jesus Christ and people are joining that church, you know what we ought to say? Awesome! Our job is not to just get more people to come here. Our job is to get people to go there. And if we never grow any bigger than what we are, but heaven is expanded by real-life souls, God's going to say, well done, good faith, sir. What a difference. Now, what was the concept of this whole chapter? What was lost needs to be found. All right, let's put this together. This is the people that some people at the early service has asked me to send them this whole slide. What does the teaching of all of this teach? Here we go. The Father is always seeking the lost. That means God is always looking for lost people. We are all prodigals. Even after we get saved, we still wander. Okay. Some of us are acting like God is dead. Even after we got saved. We get saved. There's a Greek word called lasciviousness. Anybody ever hear that word? You know what that means? I'm saved. I've, God's got to let me go to heaven. So that means I can do all the sinning I want to do because I've already asked Jesus in my heart and he can't go back on his promise. So I can sin all I want to and God's still got to let me go to heaven. Let me just say, you have that thought in your heart, I doubt whether or not you really got saved. Wow, that's it. And so we're acting like God is dead. We are squandering our lives. Now, we squander our lives by squandering our money. We squander our money, we squander our lives. And real life will reveal what we really have equity in. You know what that means? What, what, what are you willing to support? Where are you putting your money? Where are you putting your time? Where are you putting your treasures? Where are you putting your talents? If it's in the, the youth soccer league and you don't have time for God, you don't have time for witness, you have, don't have time to read your Bible, you don't have time to go to church, but you can run the concession stands, you know all that all day in the man, if you're a part of the soccer league, I would say you're investing your equity in something too. Now that doesn't mean that you can't do that, but you should never do anything with leave, and leave God out of everything. God deserves his what? Can we talk about it 10%? He deserves our all. He requires our 10%. Uh, we must come to our senses. There are sometimes our Christian people are acting like, you know, like we're not Christian people. We just act like the rest of the world. We need to say, wait a second. Whoa, wait a second. Uh, and then we must come out of our stuff. How many of us are, oh, I've done this so long. I've heard people say this. That's just the way God created me. No, it's not. God created you for a wonderful life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believed in him should not perish. And God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through his son might be saved. We are saved by grace. So that if anyone was to say, how are you saved? It's by grace because God has prepared good works for you to do before the foundation of the world. Before he ever said, let there be light, he already had planned a good, holy life for everyone. 
as taking John 3 and Ephesians 2 and Galatians 2 and putting them all together. We must confess our sins if we're going to have any forgiveness of sins. If we're going to come to the Father, the first thing we have to do is come confess it. And sometimes we confess that we don't even know that we've done something. And have you ever anybody say, Lord, forgive me even for the sins I don't even know I've committed? And let me just tell you, that can happen. That can happen. Uh, my wife, Margaret, is single-focused. That means that if she's really thinking about one thing, you can walk up to her and talk to her, and she might not even hear that you're talking to her. She is so single-mindedly focused. I have seen her in her classroom where kids will come up and she'll be talking to one and say, you got to do this with your problem, you got to do this with your problem. And I've seen a kid say, can I go to the bathroom? you got to do this with your problem. Okay, you got to do this with your problem. And the person leaves and all of a sudden he'll say, where's Richard? And I said, you said it was okay for him to go to the bathroom. Well, I, I never said that. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? If you're a single-minded person. Okay. Sometimes we've got to go to God and we've got to say what? I may have said yes to somebody, and it was wrong to say yes to that person. I don't even know I did it. Or even giving them a look. You know, like I might look up at the time and look down at somebody. I'm thinking, what time is it? Yeah. And put a look on my face and look at somebody and go, what are you doing now? <laughs> and offend somebody that way. I mean, we can all offend people without even knowing it. Even if I'm not the prodigal son who left home, and I'm the prodigal son who stayed kind of the goody two shoes, guess what? Your good issues is they're not good enough. We still need to do that. Rejecting lost people is rejecting the Father. When all of a sudden we say, I'm not going to win this, I'm not going to go to those people, I'm not going to say anything, I just I just don't care about them, I wouldn't mind doing that, at least they never accepted Jesus Christ. When we reject lost people, we reject the Father, because what's the heart of the Father? To seek and save the lost. Take a look at this one. The Father is looking and seeking. And so are his ears. Did you know that there are some people that are lost and they just don't even know? Anybody ever watch this TV show? Anybody know? How many of you know that this TV show is technically over? Anybody know that? Anybody watch the final episode of this TV show? Yes. The final episode of this TV show, yes, uh, I'm going to ruin it for everybody. So if you don't want to hear this, put your fingers in your ear. Did you know that the final thought of this entire episode, uh, this entire TV show, is they all end up in purgatory? Now, what does that mean? They're not in heaven. They're not in hell. They are in purgatory. Isn't that the worst place you could be? There's no place? Jesus would say, I would rather you to have you hot or cold than to be lukewarm. Lukewarm, I spit that out of my mouth. It's an island. And so, in other words, uh, God is saying, I'm purgatory. Come be hot or confess you are cold so I can do something with you. But when we come to God, we should live for God in such a way that all we want people to see is Christ in me. Even if they never know where my name is, it's not my name that's important. It's my God. Let's pray. Father, as we prepare to go out into the mission field, Lord, I know that some of us here today need to be challenged. Father, I'll confess all of us, I think, whether it be to accept you as Lord and Savior, whether to fully be dependent upon you and rely on you to meet all of my needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus, I don't have to hold that. But some of us think that we have, once we have been saved, we can just go ahead and do whatever we want to do, that we've got to get to go to heaven. We're living with that license to sin. Some of us have gotten saved and we've walked away and we're living like you're dead to us. Lord, some of us have never been saved like the tax collectors, we're just saying, tell me something that will change my heart and change my mind and give me hope in my heart. But all of us know someone and will be involved with someone's even this week. So Lord, help us to, to measure ourselves when we see we have the opportunity to share. Help us to ask ourselves this question. Would Jesus share with that person if he traded places with me right now? And Father, if your son would stop and share, and we don't have time, we rejected our responsibility to you. Lord, your word says that the world will know that we are your disciples by the way we love one another. 
And the greatest love gift we could ever bestow on someone is to share the good news that Jesus is. And so, Lord, help us to love the lost. Help us to seek the lost. Help us to disciple the found. Help us to have balance in our church. And may this nation not just be one nation under God, do loss. May we be one nation serving God this time. Lord, we're, we're going to have a great week. And I look forward to the stories of victory as they're recounted back in either my emails or telephone calls. Lord, grow your church for your glory and for their souls. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.